Okay, are we live? Okay, a uh, very warm welcome to anybody who's tuned in uh, already. Uh, my name is Pranya Manas and I'm hosting this evening, uh, the second evening of uh, our presidential visit from Sabuti, uh, who hopefully you can see as well, who is tuning in all the way from Wales. Uh, and as has become tradition in the recent months, uh, we'll just wait for people to log in, uh, say hello from wherever you are. And in a few minutes time, I'll introduce Sabuti formally uh, and we'll go into a short meditation and our interview. So I'm just going to review who we've got so far. We've got Ruby from Hackney. Hello. Nina, as usual, from NYC. Good to see you, Nina. Hello, hello uh, Nina. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dee from Kentish Town. And Graham in Trieste. Very nice. Wow, Trieste. Wow. Okay. Yeah. David Chavez all the way from Mexico. Buongiorno. Buenos dias. Sorry. That's Buenos it. dias. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong language. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Leon C, Donna Gall, very good. Kevin and Miriam. Um, oh, and Amy N from Berlin. Good to see you all. We have finally become the international centre that you uh, hoped we would be, Sabuti. Indeed. If only by, if only by accident and crisis. Yeah. Hello, Patrick from Clapton, and another Mexican, Tony. So we'll just give it another minute or two for people to arrive, and then I'll kick off our evening. Why don't you say in the chat if you were here last night as well, if you're tuning in for evening number two. Um, Sabuti is here all week. You can get it on Catch Up, of course, on our YouTube channel. Uh, Dan Utah's interview with Sabuti last night. Uh, we've got Nottingham, hello Jotada, and Carmen D from Blackheath. Very good. Sabuti, where are you tuning in from? I'm tuning in from uh, 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 Arenig. Oh. Munithan um, uh, Arenig. Right. Uh, near Bala, okay. the side of a mountain. <clears throat> My squin. Very good. No Welshman there? Can't see any so far. We've got Norfolk. <laughs> We've got Brighton. We're a bit southeastern at the moment. Okay. Except for Mexico, NYC, etc. Right. <laughs> Balancing us out all the way over there. Indeed. Yeah. Anyway, it's gone seven, Sabuti, so we'll make a start. Okay. okay. Um, so for anybody just arriving, again, my name is Pani Manis, and I'm hosting this evening. And I'm really, really thrilled that we have Sabuti, uh, in a way, visiting us uh, from Wales. Sabuti is the president of the London Buddhist Centre. He's also one of the people who helped build the place. But his being president means that he has a special friendship, if you like, with the centre and all of the people involved in it. So Sabuti uh, visits us, uh, albeit virtually this time, uh, supports the people who come along to the centre, the people who teach, the people who work here is available to people through his teachings and through personal contact. And uh, for quite some years, uh, you've been president, I believe. I don't know how many. Don't even think about it. It's, it's probably 30, 30 years or more yeah. <laughs> since Bante gave it up. Mm. Right, wow. Yeah. So it's a real honor to have you with us. Um, very important, uh, well, a very important person for our center, quite simply and uh, uh, one uh, by whose generosity I've been really struck. So I think that your being president, like I say, is an expression of friendship, uh, which I see you giving to us as a spiritual community, actually, uh, but also through your, your friendships with individuals. Um, personally, you've been a great support to me, but I know that's only one reflection of uh, uh, the same spirit in which you meet with uh, support and befriend many, many people around the London Buddhist Centre. Uh, you're also known, I think, uh, for expressing the Dharma very clearly and very warmly, I would say. Uh, but I just wanted to mention your being particularly a friend to us all at the centre uh, and how valuable that is to us. And this evening is only another expression of that. I hope there are many more. And I'll perhaps just say, 
for anybody again who wasn't here last night that Sabuti is giving an, e an interview each evening of this week. Uh, we're covering something called the system of Dharma life. Uh, I'll be asking Sabuti to say more about what that is, but we've been given by our teacher and founder, Bhante Sangharachita, a whole way of working in spiritual life split in this scheme into five great stages, as they're sometimes called. And tonight we'll be looking at the second of those called positive emotion, having looked at integration last night when Dani Uttar asked Sabuti to uh, unpack that term a little bit. Uh, but that's all from me by way of welcome. I'll be asking Sabuti some things about positive emotion uh, very soon. And there'll be a chance for you, of course, to ask questions. Uh, I suggest you save them for the second half we'll have a little leg stretch in 30, 40 minutes time, only because we may lose track of them in the chat. <laughs> so uh, when we come back after a leg stretch, you could start typing your questions and I'll make it clear when, when we'll bring those in, but do be thinking about what you'd like to ask Sabuti on this topic and we'll come to that in the later part of the evening. But for now, I'll hand over to you Sabuti for a few minutes. Yes, it seems a good idea that we tune in together a bit uh, in silent uh, meditation, or just in silence, you could say. Uh, even though we're all over the world, I'm especially moved that there are people from Mexico and New York City, and maybe there are others I haven't been told about yet. But uh, it's really remarkable that we're all able to gather in this way for this occasion. So let's just sit in silence and reflect on that, sort of, as it were, get the internet out of the way and try and feel human to human uh, across the, uh, uh, the, the, the spaces. And since we're talking about positive emotion, you could even breathe some meta into that reflection so that you're connecting in meta with all the people who are tuned in right now. All awareness is gathered in this uh, space, in this virtual space.
So if you like, you could bring your attention back to the, the screen. Pragnar Manus and uh, even to Sabuti. But uh, I'm personally going to try to keep a sense of our temporary community all gathered here, linked uh, by our awareness and now hopefully by some degree of meta. So Pragnar Manus, over to you. Here I am. Okay, thank you Sabuti. And uh, well, again, I want to say how good it is to see all of you tuning in, actually. We've got a few more Mexicans who've said hello since we uh, started. Uh, Sweden, um, wow. my own mother in East Sheen. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've, really got, we've really got an audience. So um, thank you again, Sabuti, for visiting us. Hmm. And as you know, I'm going to be asking about positive emotion, the second great stage of the Dharma life. So since we've got a range of people here, Sabuti, you've probably got order members, you've got Mitras, you've got people who may have just tuned in a few times during lockdown and have seen an email and clicked on a link. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you might say in a few words, what is positive emotion? And also tell us, is it well named? Oh. Uh, positive emotion is, well, exactly what it says, although it, uh, it requires a certain amount of definition and maybe from that point of view it's not well named uh, because emotion the word emotion doesn't correspond to any word in uh, buddhist languages the the english word emotion uh, and it's the same for other um, uh, latin based languages uh, emotion has a very very broad and rather fuzzy meaning but uh, what what is being indicated here is what comes under the heading of karma skillful karma Kushala karma, uh, that is uh, intentions uh, that are skillful in the sense that they bring benefit to self, benefit to others, real benefit, not uh, superficial benefit or material benefit necessarily, but, but uh, a benefit on a, on, a, on a psychological and spiritual plane. Mm. So uh, positive emotion is uh, those... Um, intentions, those desires that we generate, which are for the, the, the benefit of self and others, mm. very briefly. Ah, thank you. So that could sound like the whole of the spiritual life, uh, benefiting self and other. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, th these are uh, uh, intentions, if you see what I mean, the whole of the spiritual life does benefit self and other, mm. but what, what you're specifically focusing on is uh, the, these intentions, these wishes, these desires. Mm. Um, that, that, that's what um, Maitri is. It's the desire for the well-being of whoever it's directed towards. It may be oneself in the first stage of the Metabhavna, but more mm. commonly it's, it's towards others. So it, it's a, a desire, a wish, a, a wish that is positive, that's skillful, that's hmm. contributory, that uh, bring, contributes to growth, uh, to well-being. Hmm. So is it enough for me to have good desires and intentions? Well, it's a jolly good start, <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, you, you know the famous uh, it, 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 a saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, obviously, those good intentions must flow into activity. But uh, all activity, it's an essential Buddhist point, all activity comes out of the mind, comes out of, uh, out, out of our wishes, out of our desires. So one needs to start there. Intention is, is most fundamental. Mm -hmm. But a, a passing intention, which is not acted upon, has very little value, although it has some value. Mm -hmm. But unless that intention flows into action, uh, it's, it's going to wither on the vine. Okay. I've been thinking that both words, positive and emotion, <clears throat> are ordinary modern psychological power. Right. Yeah. What's their link then with the Buddhist tradition? Yes. Uh, 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 the, and they're a problem. They're uh, problematic, aren't they? Because positive emotion can sound like mere ebullience, uh, somebody being very jolly uh, and um, or being, uh, you know, the life and soul of the party. 
which may mm. not be a bad thing. But uh, just because you're very, um, you know, sort of full of energy and uh, bright and bouncy does not necessarily mean it, it's positive emotion. Quite struck by that. You know, it, it's famous, isn't it, that many comedians are often depressives. Mm. Um, this is, I don't know whether it's statistic, what the statistics are, but one knows of quite a number who were seriously depressive. Uh, if, if anybody can think back that far, Tony Hancock, the famous one, uh, uh, and uh, a number of, 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 uh, of uh, famous comics are depressive. So it's not enough just to be in a sort of a, a humorous, jolly mood. It has to be something much deeper. A, a real desire, a real wish. So uh, yes, uh, the, the your, your question was about the uh, these terms coming, f you know, being located in modern parlance, and that is true. But when we look at them a bit more closely in the Buddhist context, they mean something rather more than that. Um, so what one could say of of, uh, of positive emotion, particularly in the sense of of metta, which is the primary positive emotion, that is the wish for the well-being of another or of oneself, the genuine well-being. Um, it has a characteristic of being even slightly ecstatic, ecstatic not in the common sense but in the literal sense of standing outside yourself. So that, that um, when you really feel metta, you, you go beyond yourself to some extent. Uh, you, you, I won't say lose yourself, but you're no longer sort of focused back on yourself. Your attention goes outwards towards the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this really uh, goes very, very deep indeed. If you can continue this process far enough, it completely transcends self-clinging, it, it, it completely it transcends self-attachment, which is synonymous with enlightenment. The Buddha is the one who uh, went beyond self to the point at which uh, uh, his metta, his, his loving kindness, his love was universal. Mm. Could you just gloss the word self-clinging for us briefly, that it's, letting yeah, go of that is synonymous yeah, with enlightenment? Yeah, isn't it? yeah. well, we, we all know what selfishness is. Uh, again, is a quite common term. Uh, and um, y y when we talk about somebody being selfish, what we mean is that they very obviously and uh, um, you know, rather offensively put themselves first. Uh, uh, they, they don't share so much, they don't give, they, they always make sure that they're all right and so on. And that's, of course, when we use it in that way, it's, it's, it's too much in ordinary terms. But actually, we're all selfish. In the end, we're all concerned with I, uh, with, with ourselves. It's quite natural and, and normal. It's uh, an animal instinct that has kind of uh, uh, become more sophisticated in, human, in the human case. Ah. But um, uh, the... the, the the self that we are attached to, uh, when we look really deeply at it, doesn't really exist, not as something permanent and fixed and uh, ultimate. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a, a merely a conventional term uh, that we use in order to uh, uh, go through our lives, say, you know, you ask the questions and I answer. Uh, uh, but uh, in, in any more deep sense, it, it's not really quite like that when we examine what I am, I'm something much more complex, a, a, a much uh, more uh, complex assemblage of energies and uh, uh, conditionings and so forth. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> when, we, when we let go of, of, of self, we're let going of that, letting go of that deep uh, a, attachment to that deep mm. sense of a separate uh, fixed I. Mm. And do you think that for many of us in the West today, that selfishness or self-orientated activity of the mind, let's say, is easy to see? Is easy to see. Uh, well, it, it, in a way, it's never easy to see. It's never been easy to see uh, because it's natural to us. Mm. Uh, you, you know, it comes, it emerges out of our animal nature, the animal an organism that's uh, 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 organized for its survival. And 
you know, the animal does everything to survive, mm. uh, fights and flies and so forth in order to survive. The humans develop this extraordinary capacity for abstraction. So we can, we can uh, think, we can basically use language and we can isolate ourselves from the immediacy of experience and we become sort of attached to that. Mm. So it, it's very, it's an instinct that then becomes connected with our human capacity for abstraction, mm. for conceptualization. Mm. So it's really hard to see because mm. it's deeply buried within us. It's uh, from, uh, from an evolutionary point of view, it's from deep in our, 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 our natural instinctive nature from a, a Buddhist uh, point of view of uh, multiple rebirths. It's something we've been doing for countless lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not something we wake up in the morning and say, I think I'll have an eye. It's, uh, it's there. It's just there. So it's not easy to see. Mm. I think what's different about the, 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 the modern situation is that uh, for many of us, and not for everybody, no doubt not even for everybody here, we've been mm. precipitated into a culture which uh, does not have a strong sense of community. Uh, which does not give us a strong sense of belonging. I think that's why it's so important that we, we are building a Buddhist community, uh, not just uh, um, teaching the Dhamma, we're creating Sangha, because it's un a nat unnatural circumstance that people are in these days, of mm. extreme uh, uh, individualism, of separateness, of course, it's various. It's different for different people. Some people from some backgrounds still have a strong sense of, of belonging. Some people it, uh, uh, have strong sense of family uh, connection. But actually, Britain is uh, uh, certainly amongst uh, the kind of class and background I come from. It's quite radically um, de deracinated. We've moved out of our roots, away from our community. Mm -hmm. So I think that modern circumstances, especially aided by the internet, uh, which enables us to occupy our own world uh, and um, to get uh, at least virtual uh, simulacrum of satisfaction uh, through the screen, all accentuates uh, this sense of I. Uh, and so I think that in some ways it is more difficult than it's, uh, it's been before, you know, no doubt all times have their difficulties in, in, in sensing uh, this deep underlying uh, self-clinging. Good, thank you for that. Uh, you've given something of a tour there through <laughs> the whole path in terms of positive emotion, the problem yes. of clinging and uh, uprooting that as a solution and said something today about the situation, uh, why it's needed and yeah. what we've become mm. distant from. And perhaps we'll come mm. back to that. Mm. But to take us right back to the simple matter of what positive emotion is, I'm, uh, I've got another question, uh -huh. which is to do with positive and pleasant, and whether okay. they're the same. Oh, good. Positive emotion sounds, of course, like something right. I personally, for my selfish motivation, would want. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Well, in the first case, it's not. Uh, in the end, of course, uh, a positive emotion will be good for you. But uh, this morning I led a session of the, the Metta Bhavna that some people will have attended. And there I began by making a very strong distinction between uh, being happy immediately and, and feeling uh, pleasure immediately and uh, developing Metta. You can be thoroughly miserable and develop Metta. Mm -hmm. You can be in acute pain and develop Metta. We have ex outstanding examples of that, of, of people who are in really extreme circumstances of pain, who still, you know, give the last glass of water to somebody else or whatever it is, mm. as a sort of self-sacrifice. Mm. So uh, positive emotion is, 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 is uh, a karma, as I say. And uh, all human experience is divided into, into two broad categories. Oh. Uh, there's what happens to us, what we, uh, we are, as it were, passive to, what, what we uh, experience as the result of causes and conditions. And there's what we do, both mentally and verbally and through our actions. So this is, is, is a very, very basic distinction in Buddhism between what's called karma, that is this willed action, this intentional action, 
and what's called vipaka uh, mm. or phala, which means fruit or result, result or fruit. Yeah. Uh, so there's uh, the actions that we perform and then the results that flow from those actions. So what we're experiencing now is partly the result of our own past actions, partly the, the result of uh, other factors um, which are not directly to do with us. Uh, so, for instance, if you if you're the victim of, of a, 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 a social hierarchy, as it were, it's not your fault. Um, how you respond to that, that is yours. Famously, Dr. Ambedkar in India said, uh, you know, I was born into the, the, the caste situation that was not in my hands, but I will not die in those circumstances. Wow. So he's distinguishing between the vipaka of what happens to you and the karma of what you, what you do. So uh, maitri, metta, positive emotion is on that side. That's why, yes, you can be uh, quite, uh, uh, um, yeah, in, in some suffering even, uh, mm -hmm. in some pain, and yet feel feel uh, metta, uh, develop positive emotions. A very famous incident in our movement's uh, history when uh, uh, our teacher, Ergen Sangrakshita, was at a conference, a Buddhist conference, and one of the, the speakers there, I, I won't name him, but he was a famous um, uh, teacher, uh, and uh, he, each speaker was asked, what is the most important thing about Buddhism? And this teacher said, well, the most important thing is to be happy. And it next came to Bhante. And he said, well, to be honest, I don't agree. Uh, you can't always be happy. And indeed, just now I had the sense that that speaker wasn't quite happy. But you can be friendly. So that makes the point very, very clear. Positive emotion is, is to do with uh, 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 friendliness, mm. not to do with uh, feeling, uh, you know, full of beans and so forth. Um, and, and, and happy and in a good situation. And this is the great test of us as human beings. Can we retain our emotional positivity under difficult circumstances? Mm. Again, I remember a time, forgive me if I'm saying too much, but uh, I remember a time when I was working with, uh, with, with Bhante and uh, we were under great difficulties. And uh, I was his secretary at that time. And We'd been talking about these difficulties in various ways. And uh, as I went to the door, I was clearly looking rather despondent. And he called me back and he said, we mustn't think of this as something that's gone wrong. It's a test. It's a test of our, our understanding of the Dhamma. It's a test of our positive emotion. Mm. So positive emotion is, is really found uh, under all and any circumstances. Mm. And, and that should be our aspiration. Mm. Again, you're a literary man. You ever you remember your Dickens, Martin Chuzzlewit? I haven't got to that one yet, actually. I'm doing I'm doing one every year. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll go to that one. It's got a wonderful passage where uh, there's a character, a Joby, who uh, acts as a servant of Martin Chuzzlewit, who's a horror, who's a you know a, a real upper class um, a, a bully, and treats his servant abominably, and. Uh, uh, and so people ask him, ask Joby, why are you working with him? He said, well, I, I, it's, I'm always cheerful and I want to make sure that my cheerfulness is genuine. So I'm putting myself into a situation of, of great difficulty. Wow. So as usual, Dickens has a tremendous psychological insight. But it's a, it's, it's, I dwelt on this a bit because it is so important. And I, I rather agree. I think positive emotion does connote, um, you know, the party mood. Mm. And uh, if you've ever gone into a party uh, at all wide awake, you can sense the brittleness of the, of the cheer often. Not always, but often. Mm. Mm. Well, speaking uh, as you have done about uh, personal relationships, uh, Martin Chuzzlewit or elsewhere, yeah. I thought I'd ask you a bit about friendship. Uh, yes. I read today a talk you gave on positive emotion. Um, which uh, you've told me, of course, you can't remember. Uh, so I thought I'd ask you lots of questions about it. <laughs> and, uh, I'd probably give different answers. <laughs> that, that's even better. So uh, you talk about friendship as being, um, uh, well, you say that the strongest influence on us is other people. Yeah. And that recourse to friends is probably the most important factor in our life. Yes. I wonder if you could say something about friendship and positive emotion. Hmm. Yeah. 
Well, uh, 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 metta, a positive emotion in, in, in the sense of, of uh, loving kindness in the Buddhist sense, mm. uh, true well-wishing towards other, that, others, that skillful karma, is uh, not necessarily reciprocated. Anybody who's done the, the metta bhavna will know that in the fourth stage, you develop it towards an enemy who many times is not thinking of you in a kindly and, and uh, metaphor way. They may be, but they may not. Uh, so metta is, uh, as it were, one-sided. But uh, when you come into friendship, there's a sharing of metta. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel well-wishing for you. You feel well-wishing for me. And we're, we're conscious of sharing that well-wishing. So uh, when, we, when, when that happens, you begin to get an augmentation of, of positive emotion. And uh, if, if that uh, augmentation of positive emotion through friendship uh, goes far enough and deep enough, there's uh, an increasing self-transcendence. Mm. You give yourself increasingly to the, uh, to the friend and you put their needs and desires before your own. And uh, uh, not out of any sense of exchange, not out of any wish, any wish on your part, but uh, yes, out of a, 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 a genuine uh, desire for their well-being and their wealth, welfare. As it happens, coincidentally, they're doing the same for you. So this is one of life's greatest blessings uh, and uh, uh, a, a tremendous source of joy and uh, gives one great confidence and um, uh, increases one's sense of e emotional positivity. So very briefly, that, that, that's the first, that's the way in which we can talk about uh, friendship. But then, of course, friendship means that in that in that relationship of mutual uh, maitri, mutual well-wishing, uh, we we work together. Uh, I remember um, uh, uh, Bhante, you explored this topic with us greatly, and he used a number of different texts. He used some Buddhist ones. There are not so many Buddhist ones. He used one um, one uh, Christian one. Uh, the, uh, what's it called uh, on friendship? by El Red of Rivo, a, a, a Christian monastic. Uh, a very, very interesting work. And another one, outstandingly, um, Al-Ghazali's uh, The Duties of Brotherhood in Islam. Mm. And we found it very, very uh, appealing and uh, uh, um, almost sort of revelatory. And I remember at one point he, he speaks of uh, friendship be like being two hands washing each other. Ah. So one hand can't wash itself. Uh, <laughs> But two hands, they can wash each other. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the benefits of, of friendship play out in that sort of way. Mm -hmm. But also, of course, it, 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 it gives great delight. Uh, and uh, uh, Bante speaks of friendship is taking delight in each other. Uh, you know, you, you see uh, Pragna Manas' uh, great um, uh, 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 sharpness of intellect, his clarity, uh, his his duty, uh, his sense of duty, his willingness to work. There we are. I'll flatter you in public. I'll speak about other things later. <laughs> and uh, you see all We've that. We've got another 15 minutes before the break, so just uh, <laughs> yeah. let that one run. Yeah, that's fine. You take delight in it. You, 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 you enjoy it. You, you rejoice in it. Uh, and, um, of course, that grows those qualities in the others, in the other, but it also uh, uh, gives you great joy. You know, sometimes you see people, especially in, in, on retreat, sort of looking at somebody across the room with a little smile of pleasure, mm. just watching the other person with delight, taking aesthetic pleasure in them. Not, not aesthetic in the, in the shallow sense of beauty of form, because some of them may not be so beautiful in form, but beauty of personality, beauty of character, mm. uh, beauty of nature. Mm. Mm. So why has friendship been so emphasized in our order and movement, do you think? Mm. Well, I, I think because we live in this era when uh, uh, um, human relationships of, of, a, of a, um, a, a traditional kind have broken down oh. for many of us. Oh. Uh, very striking. I work in India and the, the, the traditional society is still very much intact. And all human relationships are assimilated to family relationships. So anybody younger uh, will call 
me uncle, for instance. Uh -huh. And uh, they'll refer to an older person, uh, um, but of their own generation, as it were, as uh, big brother or big sister, um, uh, Dada or, uh, or, or uh, Didi. Um, but uh, so all the, 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 the sort of model for human relationships is family relationships, community relationships. Mm. But that's very much broken down to a quite radical degree. Mm. Again, not for everybody probably listening to me, but um, for many, many people in, in this society today. So we, we tend to stress the personal, the subjective, the, the, uh, the individualistic. Uh, uh, and uh, so we have to bring that out of the the the, uh, the 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 Buddhist tradition, because it's not emphasised there. It's not emphasised because it just was naturally there. No. Uh, in a natural in a in a in a natural traditional human society, friendship is just part of things. Mm. The difficulty is translating uh, 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 that into a something beyond the merely family or the merely group. Mm. But it, it's natural to people to form friendships mm. and, and to human relationships are absolutely vital to people. Uh, and again, I, I've, I learned that really very strongly with going to India. It, it, it wasn't part of my background. I've always valued friendship, but I've not really experienced myself as part of a community. Um, but uh, yes, um, in, 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 in a, even to some extent, I wanted to escape from the community. It would have been natural for me to belong to because it was a class community, which I didn't uh, approve of, as it were. I didn't feel at home in. But mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, we've had to draw out this dimension of the Dhamma because it's, uh, it's necessary now. Mm -hmm. it, before, it wasn't necessary. It's not something that needs so much emphasis. It's mm -hmm. just there. Shariputra, Maud Galyayan, you can see them. Uh, you can see that, yeah, there they are. Uh, you can see the relationship between them and so many like that. Mm. And, and if you look at the Pali Canon, you can see many, many friendships, but mm. they're not called friendships, you know, with big arrows pointing at them. They're just the way people relate to each other. Mm. And they even vertical friendship, the Buddha and Ananda. There he is. There he is. Yes. So um, immediate disciples of the Buddha you're referring to, aren't they? Oh, yes. Sorry. Yes. These are these are immediate disciples of the Buddha who are represented uh, behind uh, Pragnamanis's right and left shoulders and uh, a bit over on the on the left further. Uh, but, but but these were notable friends. And it'd be very interesting. I did actually write a book on friend, on friendship a long time ago, and I, I did have a section which didn't come out in the end, but on these friendships in the Buddhist tradition. Mm -hmm. But in our modern times, uh, we, we tend to pick and choose according to our own immediate interests, if you see what I mean. So for, as with, with, uh, with um, romantic relationships, we, 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 just, we take them up and discard them. Uh, but that is not a traditional way, for mm. better or worse. Mm. So what is getting in the way of friendship these days, do you think? Uh, well, I, I think that people, uh, there, there are many different things. First of all, I think there's this inherent individualism that most of us bring when we come into the centre. Again, not everybody. If this doesn't apply to you, please excuse me. But uh, for a great many people, this is, this is what we work, walk in with, with a strong sense the world is to be organised for us. Uh, and uh, to be exploited for our good. Not that we want to harm anybody or anything like that, but uh, it, essentially we're, we're, we're concerned with ourselves. And, and so, um, uh, yeah, we, 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 we think of friendship in the same sort of way. Some people have old friendships that go way back and keep them very much alive, but uh, it's, it's less and less common, mm. I, I think. Um, you know, generalizing in this sort of way is always dangerous with a, a large audience who you can't see them grimacing when you're speaking. But um, uh, it, it's, I think, something that we need to put much more effort into. And friendship, actually, in in uh, in the in the sense of the Dhamma, does require a, a friendship within the Dhamma does require an effort. Abante always used to uh, refer to Dr. Johnson, the great. Uh, uh, 
uh, English literary uh, figure who compiled the first English dic dictionary in the 18th century. Mm. And uh, he very highly prized friendship. And he spoke of keeping his friendships in good repair. Mm. So he worked on his friendships. He, uh, he made them uh, uh, one of his tasks, as it were. And I saw that very much with Sangharaksha himself, that he, he worked on his friendships. So uh, we need to learn that friendship is vitally important for us, for our psychic health, our ordinary psychological health. Mm. Um, uh, you know, one of the predictors of, un, of, of happiness is being connected to friends and family. Mm. Uh, you know, modern research has, has, has shown this. Pretty obvious, isn't it? But uh, if you feel that you're part of a, of a, of a, a circle of friends, a, a, you have a, a sense of a family, a sense of a community, well, you're much like, more likely to feel happy. Mm. Anomie is the disease of our times. Mm. Ah. Mm. Anomie being? This, this uh, dissociation, dis disconnection, alienation, ah. both, uh, uh, um, from, from nature, from the natural world, and from uh, a human community, human society. Ah. Uh, and uh, th this, these are all part of the same thing, I think. Mm. Don't yes. get me going on this one. It's a big topic. Ah. And there's the Buddha sitting under the tree uh, behind you, ah. with surrounded by friends, both... Uh, mundane and transcendental and i think that's extremely significant right yeah so to bring it back down to our practice now yeah. um uh which isn't to divorce it of course from the buddha under the tree with the mundane and transcendental friends yeah uh, one more for you before the break if somebody's been engaging with one of our centers for a little while and has heard many times that friendship is important yeah indeed half of or the whole of the spiritual life right. Yeah. Uh, they've heard the stories, uh, but they're not experiencing very much of it in their life mm. yet. Mm. Um, what would you say is good for them to do? Mm. Well, first of all, I'd be a little surprised. Mm. Uh, I, I, I hope it wouldn't, wouldn't be because uh, the centre they're associating with isn't very friendly. Mm. Uh, of course, there may be particular factors at work. You know, for instance, well, I mentioned class. Uh, that can be a factor, race can be a factor, and so on, where, where people don't feel quite at home and other people don't respond to them as well as they should. So all of that may be in, in play. I, I don't want to generalize. Mm. But uh, what I would say is uh, uh, um, just try to keep a connecting with, uh, with people, especially on retreat. Uh. I, I remember that very strongly myself, my very first retreat. Uh, in the Suffolk countryside, my goodness, uh, in 1970, 1969, my goodness, does time go back that far? Uh, in 1969, uh, I went on my first retreat, the Easter retreat, uh, led by Bantu, about 70 people there. And what was really striking for me, apart from anything else, apart from the, the triple meditation, the first morning of the, of the retreat, led by Bante and other notable factors like that. But uh, what was noticeable for me was uh, I made five friendships on that occasion. And if, in fact, uh, I, I made a number of others too, but I made uh, four friendships rather uh, at that time that are still with me. Mm. You know, many of you around the LBC will know Dhamma Dinna. Uh, she was one of those. I, I connected with her way back then, and we're still connected, uh, and uh, a, a number of others. So what I, I, I lived in a community at that time in London, a kind of um, post-student flat uh, uh, community. We were very friendly. Um, you know, it was the high days of rock and roll and uh, drugs and all that. Not enough sex for me, but that's another question. Um, but... Uh, it, it, it was, it was a, you know, at the, at the human level, it was quite positive, quite emotionally positive even. But I noticed a completely different quality of friendship mm. with these people I was connecting with uh, in, the, in, in the context of the, the Dhamma. And hard in retrospect to say exactly what it was, but it was as if almost immediately there was a sense of recognition. Uh, you know, not that we'd been together in past lives or something like that, but we were at the same place in our lives with the same uh, needs and interests. And of course, doing the same practices, doing the Metta Vavna together, 
So I would expect that if you uh, are persistent enough, uh, friendships will begin to flower. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be internal factors that stand in the way, maybe self-view. Uh, there may be, as I say, external factors because uh, sometimes one doesn't feel one fits into certain situations because of, uh, uh, you know, the Sangha is constantly having to expand its, its boundaries so that it speaks uh, the language that approaches all. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I would like to think that anybody associating with anybody, any of our centers uh, uh, will sooner or later experience friendship beginning to flower. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily mean just with the teachers, uh, but with, uh, you know, the, the people I was connecting with were newcomers like me. And mm -hmm. uh, those friendships, as I say, are still with me. And I would, I would agree. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Good. So um, thank you very much uh, for the conversation so far, Sabuti. We'll just take a five minute break now for people to stretch their legs or get a drink or whatever they need to do um, and unmute again at 10 to 8. Uh, okay. We'll talk a little bit more, uh, but all of you watching can, as I say, be preparing your questions and in fact starting to type them into the box now, if you like. Um, I and uh, my two friends here in the shrine will gather them and I'll start to put some of them to Sabuti. Uh, or what there's time for anyway, but see you five minutes from now. Good.
okay. You're muted. You're muted. There we are. Yeah, got me now. Yep. I don't have, it's not my hands on the controls, you see. So <laughs> I get an impotent sort of feeling when trying to unmute there. Anyway, here we are, we're back. Good. So it's, it's 10 to eight. Uh, we've got a few questions. Um, uh, but first, you said uh, that, oh, I can't see you. No, you're back. That uh, anomie uh, was uh, one of the worst afflictions of our times. I can't remember how you worded it. And you said, don't get me going on that. Uh, but I thought I would briefly get you going on that. Right. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I suppose that I, I, my general sense is that uh, we are when I say we, again, please excuse me if I'm not talking about you and look with pity on the likes of me. Uh, uh, but uh, many of us are so radically disconnected from nature, uh, the natural world around us. Uh, we, 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 you know, famously, of course, we've exploited the natural world to the point at which it uh, seems as if it's going to destroy us. Um, but the, the real key thing is we've lost a sense of its life. Uh, so we, we've uh, we've sort of objectified the world, and we've uh, tended to um, overemphasize the the rational and the, the 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 technical and so forth. So I think that our our Buddhist work is extremely important, and our work in building a community and in developing positive emotion and friendship is absolutely crucial to our own individual uh, happiness, uh, but also to um, a better society. Uh, we, we need to try to create a, a, a society in which people are really connected, mm -hmm. are connected to each other, connected to the natural world around them, and of course, connected to the ultimate nature of things. Mm -hmm. That's a very brief getting going. You, you... <laughs> yes, yeah, you, you were very restrained. It's very yes, good. very restrained, yeah. Um, and... Uh... Well, I've been thinking a little bit as you've been talking about Sangharachita's aphorism, uh, the good is the enemy of the best. Oh, hmm. And uh, all of these uh, efforts sound positive, uh, positive emotion um, going oh. against this enemy, etc. Um, friendship is important, you've been saying. Sure. Um, how do we avoid the good uh, getting in the way of the best when it comes to positive emotion? Right. Well, I, I suppose the danger is that we, you know, for instance, we build a nice Buddhist community mm. uh, where we're, we're in good contact with each other. We have a pleasant environment mm. and uh, we uh, are, are sort of at a, at a relatively uh, ordinary level, fairly happy. And we settle down there. We plateau, as they say. Ah. Uh, and I've experienced that myself, that, mm. uh, you know, I came along a little bit of a mess. And uh, as a result of my Buddhist practice, and especially as a result of developing a stronger sense of friendship and of community, I think I sorted myself out to some degree. Mm. But then, well, you want to enjoy it. Fair enough. Uh, and you sort of tend to, to, uh, to rest on it, rest on your laurels, such as they are. Mm. They're not the highest laurels. They're not the, the, the big race. Uh, and uh, so you need to be careful to... Uh, settle for se not to settle for second best mm. uh, because you'll find if you examine closely that state of relative human happiness which is very important uh, what uh, Sangra actually used to call the happy healthy human state mm. he thought that most people needed to achieve that happy healthy human state mm -hmm. which he equated interestingly enough with the pagan and that connects with uh, what we've been talking about uh, uh, as a connection with nature. So, yes, that's, that's a big achievement. But there will be, if one's sensitive, underneath that, still a sense of dissatisfaction. Oh. Uh, uh, and uh, in, in, in Buddhist tradition, uh, uh, pain, suffering, dukkha, is spoken of on three levels. The most superficial level is actual pain. 
well, superficial in the sense that it's uh, in a terms of analysis, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, somebody hitting you or something like the disease or whatever. Slightly deeper down in the analysis is uh, the mental suffering that comes because we're not adjusted to reality so that um, when, when, thing, when we become attached to things, they change and we suffer. Uh, so uh, you, can, you, can, you can actually organize for yourself a fairly good worldly life if you're skillful, if you live positively. You can build that up. But uh, then deeper down, there's, there's a, a sense within one at the background of one's consciousness of uh, uh, something not quite right. Hmm. So it, it, it's, uh, to put this very briefly, it's the fact that you are attached to conditions. You're attached to what must change, to what is actually impermanent. And you do not recognize uh, the, 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 the infinite possibilities of your own mind, your own experience. Mm. So you will feel that. You'll feel a sort of tension at the back of it. So I think it's very important to pay attention to that and to continue to work on yourself. So mm. that this is where uh, Metta, for instance, loving kindness, uh, can take us into the transcendental. Men most people here will have done the, the Metta Bhavna practice. Uh, and you know, in that practice, you start by developing uh, Maitri towards yourself, wishing yourself well, then a friend, a near and dear friend, because that's easy. And then a, a, a neutral person, somebody you don't really know, no connection with, because that's extending you a little bit further. And then you really put yourself to the test and develop it towards an enemy. Then in the fifth stage, after equalizing between those, those four people, you start to expand the meta. And you expand it out to the point at which it just becomes completely universal. Now, this is not just an exercise in radiating meta, as it were. A point comes if you're doing this practice successfully when meta takes over. Maitri becomes a sort of force in its own right, independent of you. Mm. In fact, it sort of pushes you aside. So what, what one may experience, I've certainly experienced this myself, is that it's not you developing meta, it's meta sort of developing through you. Meta is bigger than you. Hmm. It's as if meta, love, you could say, is, um, is working through you. Hmm. Uh, uh, amor vincit omnes. Have I got my, my case endings right there, um, Pregnant Manus? I think the last letter might be wrong, I'd guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what is correct. Anyway, anyway love conquers all. Yeah, uh, it, it, I'll get my mum to email you. There we are. <laughs> so when when uh, when um, when you really get to the point of a positive emotion at that level, it ceases to be personal. Mm. It becomes transcendental, we would say. Mm. Uh, it becomes uh, the, the the maitri that the Buddha would feel. Mm. At that point, you've touched on enlightenment. So positive emotion goes there, goes right to those heights, and there should be this tendency to ecstasis mm. ecstasy literally means standing outside standing outside what yourself so you're uh, you're uh, uh, even if i feel meta for another person mm. let's say even you since you're right in front of me uh, mm. if i feel for you then i'm going out of myself a bit yeah. uh, you know i've left myself behind a little bit of course mm. i quickly drop back into myself but if I really develop this meta more and more and more, a point comes where the meta becomes self-generating. Mm. It, it, it requires no effort from me. It ceases even to be a karma mm. in the, so far as I'm not intending it. It's more like I am being meta rather than that I am doing meta. Mm. Uh, forgive me. I am, being, I am being love rather than I am loving, if mm. you see what I mean. So uh, 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 I think there's a natural sort of tendency in, in, in Maitri and in positive emotion. It starts off as a, as a mundane human emotion, which is extremely important. And we need to develop that much more. Wouldn't it be so much better if the whole uh, culture and environment was much more positive? Uh, and 
um, much more healthy in that sort of way, more natural, health, happy, healthy human beings, uh, which are very rare in, in uh, 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 the alienated West uh, mm. or large, large parts of it. But if we, if we develop that happy human state, then we can begin to push beyond that into something that is uh, spiritual in the sense of touching on higher states of consciousness, still, as it were, falling back upon self, but going beyond self, where you're touching on gigantic universal forces, mm. uh, huge universal forces that you're in connection with. But uh, even that is not enough. One needs to take the extra step where you get out of the way entirely and you simply, your mundane uh, psychophysical being, simply becomes the vehicle for a transcendental love, mm. compassion. Oh, yeah, I'm very glad you've uh, brought in the transcendental. Um, yes. And that sounding like uh, something that, well, is not immediately conjured anymore by the words positive emotion, although no. I know that you're no. elaborating the whole path in the terms of this yes. stage, I think, or showing how it can lead us. Yeah actually beyond our ordinary human experience that's very good yeah. to uh yeah in. i think um, each of these each of these aspects uh, is a path in itself hmm. uh, but of course when they're, they're they're put in terms of a hierarchical system uh positive emotion being the second stage integration being the first stage we're talking about something more like human happy healthy human level but as you go into uh, into the other stages, spiritual death and uh, spiritual rebirth, then the positive emotion isn't left behind. It's transcended. It becomes something more than itself, if you see what I mean, mm. just as the integration does, too. Mm. So each stage is is uh, carried into the next stage and, uh, and amplified, extended by it. Mm. Thank you. So what I'll do now is bring in some of the questions we've had, uh, which okay. people can add to. Uh, you've sort of set out, as I say, uh, the vision there, uh, yeah. the ultimate vision of this stage of the path. Hmm. To go back to uh, struggles people might have in reaching towards that, which is of course yes. what we're all uh, what we're all in at the moment. Um, I've got questions. Well, I'm going to combine questions here from Erin and Emma, um, which are to do with, well, Erin asks, what do we do with negative emotions? And Emma has said, what are some near enemies of positive emotions? So yes. that's something you could say about those. Yes, yes. Well, I talked a little bit about negative emotion yesterday uh, and uh, under the heading of integration. I can't remember how it sneaked in under the bar there. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, it, what I was saying there is that there are two, well, it, uh, I, I said there's an approach that you could take, uh, which I think is an important one. But there's another approach you could take, which is to, of course, try to eradicate it. You try to eradicate the, the negative emotion. And that's the most common way of talking about it. In the, anybody who knows the Eightfold Path will know of the, 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 the uh, uh, stage of, of perfect effort and the four right efforts, the effort to uh, eradicate negative states that have arisen and to uh, uh, keep them out and then to develop positive states and to maintain them. So you could take that approach that you're trying to get rid of them. You, 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 uh, you try to eliminate them from your mind. And certainly that is important and needs to be done. But the, the, the approach that I mentioned yesterday, I think also needs to be brought into play, which is recognizing that behind all negative emotion is energy. And energy, as it were, is, uh, well, you could say either neither good nor bad, but in, in a certain sense, it's, it's uh, of itself uh, good. Uh, so, there's, there's something going on within you that energies within you are not flowing well and they're blocked in some way. So I think it's, 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 it's also good to think what is the, uh, what, what's the factor, what's behind this, what is the emotion behind this, uh, or rather the energy behind this. And I mentioned last night my angry dreams, which tell me that my, my creativity is blocked if you see what I mean, I'm not getting enough creative expression. Uh, 
Mm. I'm not doing enough things that, or saying enough things, or feeling enough things that are really fulfilling me. So it, 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 it easily plays out in my dreams as, as, as the angry dreams, or if, if at, the, at worst, at uh, a, a grumpy nest, or at, a, no, that's not the worst, at the very worst, actual, you know, anger. Uh, so what is it? What's the energy behind this? And how are you going to channel that in a more skillful direction? Mm -hmm. I don't think it, it's enough just to think in terms of suppression. It may be in the context of meditation, because in the context of meditation, if you can suppress or push it out, then you're able to develop more skillful mental states. But uh, you're still going to have to, at some stage, deal with the underlying uh, energies and, uh, and convert them, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So I, I offer those two ways of thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that, uh, one is to think in terms of, of, of cultivating the positive, and of trying to eliminate the, the negative but the other is to try to see the energy that's present in the in, in the negative emotion mm. and recognize what it's uh, what its skillful fulfillment would be mm. Mm. so some of the near enemies of positive emotion what well, what might they be do you think well uh, the, the, it's, it's traditionally said the far enemy of of meta of love of love let's call it that is hatred but the near enemy is is sort of affection. Uh, well, uh, Bante at one point called it sticky affection. In in other words, a sort of sentimental, even romantic, maybe uh, affection that um, uh, is not really for the other person. It's for something that you can get out of them. Uh -huh. You know what? It, often our, our supposed love for others, and this is classic in in uh, many romantic relationships our love for the other is, is apparent love for the other is really about me that's why when he or she rejects one becomes so upset after all if if they, they reject you and they go off with somebody else you should be happy for them but it gives the game away <laughs> uh, our, we we've been into the into the uh, into the near enemy of of genuine love mm. so uh, uh, um Yes, uh, uh, th this is the classic formulation that mm -hmm. um, there are things that look like a positive emotion. I talked about ebullience. You know, somebody is always jolly, uh, mm -hmm. always, um, you know, cracking jokes and, and so forth. And, uh, you know, sometimes that's OK, but sometimes it's um, it, it, it's it's so insensitive uh, and it's not really related to other people. It, it's uh, just a sort of self-assertion. Uh, and uh, so you can find a, a number of different ordinary expressions of what might appear to be positive emotion that are actually uh, merely uh, its near enemy. Mm. So it's a good question. Mm. Or, mm. And since we've also got a question about uh, introverted and extroverted tendencies, presumably quietly, privately feeling good isn't enough either. You've been putting it mainly in terms of ebullience, but perhaps as an introvert, I tend to think, ah, oh, yes, uh, I might be sitting on my own with my eyes closed, enjoying myself very much. Um, yeah. Is that the yeah. same thing? Mm. Yes, yes. Well, it, it can be very good. It's very good to experience that, that sense, which what we call contentment, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, which is an extremely important uh, emotion in Buddhism, santushti. Mm. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, what we're all trying to cu cultivate. And it's essentially the counterpart of uh, greed, of craving. Mm. So it's the positive emotional counterpart of, of craving. It's that sense that uh, you don't need anything. You don't want anything. Mm. You know, you get that sometimes, especially on retreat or just after meditation. You, you don't really want anything. You just realize it's all there. Everything you want is there. Now, please don't get rid of that. Don't think <laughs> of that as a near enemy. <laughs> uh, but... Um, Yes, it, at, uh, at, at some point that, that shouldn't then become protective mm -hmm. and, and, you know, where you're unwilling to engage, you're unwilling to respond mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you're trying to protect this state. As mm -hmm. soon as you start to protect it, you've lost it. Mm -hmm. what, you, what, you, what you're saving is a sort of private heaven world. Yes, I've probably got plenty to do feeling that a little bit more often, actually, personally, <laughs> rather than rejecting it. Anyway, 
Um, so those of you listening, do keep your questions coming. I've got one more I'm going to put to Sabuti now, but we've got uh, time for a few more as well. So do be putting those in the chat box. Um, to take us back up uh, in the direction of the transcendental again, Sabuti, sorry, it's a bumpy ride. Yes. Um, Adriana has asked uh, whether, uh, if she feels in meditation that she knows metta to be ultimate reality, right. is there something in that? Is that right? Oh my goodness, of course it is. Uh, <laughs> of course it is. Of, you know, there are so many ways you could say this is ultimate reality. But uh, I think it's, 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 uh, it's, it's very important that uh, we, we recognize that uh, uh, love, I, I, I sometimes, in this sort of context, you'd like to use that good old Anglo-Saxon word, love, um, it, because it's, uh, you know, when, when we remove it from all its complex com connotations, it is really what we mean. It, it's, uh, it, it's the nature of reality, if you like. Is is meta is love, um, uh, the, the the ultimate nature of things is is uh, of that kind. Mm. Uh, so that when you're doing when you're doing the meta bhavna, you're kind of tuning into that. Uh, this is not much spoken of in the Buddhist tradition, really, although it is in certain contexts, mm. uh, not so much in basic Buddhism, uh, but it's spoken of mainly in terms of. Uh, the balance of wisdom and compassion, isn't it? That wisdom is compassion. Mm. Compassion is wisdom. Mm. If you've got wisdom, you've got compassion. Uh, and of course, compassion is metta, maitri, when directed to those who suffer. So from the Buddha's point of view, uh, that's uh, his metta is directed to everybody else and we're all suffering. So mm. of course, it's it's compassion. Mm. So it, it, the fact that the Buddha... Uh, experiences that as of the nature of his of, of his buddhahood is really significant and adriana's uh, um, intuition is absolutely correct mm. she's getting at what the buddha experiences mm. now of course one mustn't become over fixated on any particular way of thinking about it but yes i think that when you're doing the metta bhavna don't think of it as a preliminary practice i've been told this by uh, one or two um, um, people, Theravadins mainly, that uh, oh, metta is, a, is a, an elementary practice. Uh, but that's not what I've been taught uh, by my teacher, again, Sangharakshita, our teacher, and it's not what I've experienced. Mm. Uh, metta is extremely profound. Positive emotion, uh, when, as I've said, when taken uh, at, at highest levels, when uh, transformed by um, uh, spiritual death and spiritual rebirth, is, is reality itself. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't think of reality as something sort of cold and kind of a principle in, in a, mm -hmm. an impersonal sense. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, Sangrakshita said that he thought it was better to think of, of reality itself as personal, but not in, in, the, in, the, in the ordinary sense, but as, as a suprapersonal uh, reality. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's why you're sitting in front of Amitabha, Amitabha represents uh, absolute reality. He represents the ultimate nature of things. And what does he hold in his hand on his uh, begging bowl? He holds a, um, a, a red lotus. Mm. And the red lotus represents Maitri, Metta. Mm. So uh, uh, th 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 this is a representation of exactly your intuition, Adriana which I'm very pleased indeed that you, you've, you've sensed that. Uh, and, and I think the Metta Bhavna, uh, of course, reinforced, accompanied by all other practices, can be a, a, the, the way to, to the transcendental. Mm. And to stay with uh, meditation experience, mm. uh, Love, uh, the old-fashioned Anglo-Saxon term you mentioned, yes. sounds like a, sounds like a feeling, doesn't it? We've got a question oh. about whether it's mainly is a feeling or an intention. Oh. Uh, well, yes, love is a, a very overworked um, word, isn't it? Oh, I love um, bacon, <laughs> bacon sandwiches. Why did that come to my mind? It was <laughs> You're going to have to tell me. <laughs> I did it. We live, use it in such a trivial way. 
it, it really does. And even even you know, I love you. Often uh, it, it's um, it's it's really an expression either of lust or of um, attachment. Wow. Uh, so we overwork the term love. Uh, but when we really mean when we really mean love in the sense that we've just been talking about it, uh, it it's um, it's not really uh, you know you know a sensation. Well, it will be accompanied by one, but it's mainly to do with an uh, an attitude, although you could hardly call it an attitude at that level, uh, a, a, a consciousness, the nature of consciousness, uh, it, it, the way in which all is seen at that level. So it, it's, it, it's a karma. It, now, if you have any karma, uh, Sorry, I should just say, of course, at the transcendental level, it's not even a karma because uh, the karmic level is transcended then. But uh, at, at slightly lower levels, any karma uh, under the law of karma will have an effect. So if you develop metta to any extent, sooner or later, you'll feel good. I don't know whether you remember this when you first started practicing, but I, I remember it very strongly. I do the Metta Bhavna with great sweat and, uh, and effort and trying to keep my mind focused and uh, struggling to, uh, um, uh, you know, really feel Metta for an enemy and so on. And I'd come out of it sort of feeling a little bit uh, strained almost. And then maybe later in the day, I would suddenly unaccountably feel a warmth in my chest. I'd feel sort of unaccountably contented and happy and so forth. So I think that was the delayed vipaka, delayed fruit of the, the effort that I'd made. Nowadays, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit more skillful in my life in general, and the, 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 the time lag between karma and vipaka is a bit shorter. So mm -hmm. generally speaking, if I do the metta bhavna, mm -hmm. uh, not only do I feel metta for others and maybe get some little tinge of the uh, the transcendental dimension but i feel really good i feel really happy um, and uh, so yes uh, uh, love um is primarily in, in its primary character is its other orientation uh, it, it, it's it, it's it, it the attitude or intention towards others but of its very nature it will have a feedback upon you Hmm. You can verify this in your own experience hmm. doing the Metta Bhavna. You, you're, you really can see it. Uh, I, I almost guarantee anybody who does the Metta Bhavna with a certain degree of, of uh, sincerity and, you know, maybe not all that concentrated or whatever, but you really do try to mean, may he or she be well. If you really try to mean it, even a little bit of, of really meaning it, that will have a good effect on you. Hmm. But that's not why you're doing it. <laughs> if you're doing it for that sake, it won't work. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It will only work to a lesser extent. Oh, okay. So I think there's probably time for one more. Uh -huh. And we do have one more. Uh, it's what your thoughts are on female and male friendship uh, from <laughs> Julie. So perhaps a big new subject. I don't know if Julie means friendship between the sexes or... Um, among them, I can't, I can't tell, but uh, yeah. perhaps that's yeah. enough for you to say something. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, the, the, for instance, when we do the Metta Bhavna, we generally recommend to people that they, uh, when, when they do the, the Metta towards a near and dear friend, that they focus on a member of their own uh, gender. Of course, that may be complicated for some people, but uh, because in that way, you remove uh, as a certain polarization factor, uh, which may mean that the emotion you're developing is not meta. Hmm. So that, that's the chief issue, uh, is, is um, um, if, if you're developing, if you're trying to develop friendship with somebody, are there other factors that are getting in the way? Uh, so, but uh, nonetheless, I do believe, and I'd say I, I, I know I experience friendship in my case with women. Mm. I'm sure of it. I have good friends, good spiritual friends with women. Mm. I think it would have been much more difficult for me quite a long time ago. Well, not so long ago, but many years ago when I was more polarized 
if you see what I mean, as, as identifying as a, uh, as, as a male. Uh, but that's lessened to some extent, partly just because of old age, but uh, partly because I've tried to work on myself. So I think that it, the, 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 there's uh, a lesser degree of polarization uh, you're trying to, to make sure there's a least degree of polarization. Now, it's complex. What about those who are attracted sexually to their own gender or fall in love with their own gender? What about those who do not find it easy to identify with any particular gender? So I, I find it more difficult to comment there. But uh, for, for, you know, probably a, a, a fairly uh, substantial majority of people do uh, find it relatively easy to identify with one a pole or another and and there one just has to take that into account mm. is what you're doing in uh, developing uh, um, friendship with a member of the opposite sex uh, really friendship or is it something else uh, you know for instance I think I used to to look for, for to women either for of course romantic reasons or for to mother me uh, uh, that sort of thing. So other factors get mixed up. But to the extent that you can begin to transcend your uh, a gender identification, that, that happens less and less. Mm -hmm. But in our, in our, in our movement, we, we do offer opportunities for people to deepen their friendships within the context of their own gender. And not everybody, but most people, many people find that uh, beneficial. And especially, especially perhaps today when... Uh, uh, the, 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 the nature of the relation between the, the genders is, is under question. And especially when it's more difficult to know what it is to be a man. I think there's been a lot of emphasis on, on women exploring what it is to be a woman, but it's much more difficult for men to, to know. Uh, and uh, to have connection with members of your own gender, uh, deepening your friendship with them, whether you're attracted to them or not, because you're not attracted to them all, so I've been told, uh, just as one isn't attracted to all members of the opposite sex. Uh, it, it, uh, it, has, it, it draws out something from you. Mm. It enables you to uh, uh, um, sort of lessen the tension. The Buddha speaks about this very interestingly. He talks about, um, oh, what, what is a sutta, which is called uh, connection and disconnection. And he talks about what happens when a man comes into relationship with a woman and a woman comes into relationship with a man. Not necessarily talking about sex, but he says when, when, when you come into relationship with a member of the opposite sex, and of course he's using traditional categories here, uh, you become more aware, for instance, of your own maleness. Uh, and uh, so you become more polarized. So when you're connecting with other men uh, as a man, uh, you'll, 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 that, that tension is lessened. Now, this is complex. It's all under debate at the present, so I, I don't want to uh, overstress it, but I, I inv invite some reflection and, and exploration of it. And certainly myself, I've benefited very, very much indeed from uh, 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 living in, in, in single-sex contexts and working mm. this, those contexts, because mm. I think I, I came to grow as an individual uh, much more, um, mm. which isn't to say that I, I, I can't be uh, an individual with, 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 uh, with women. And I, mm. I don't have very good friendships with women. And, and nowadays, that's not so much of an issue for me. Mm -hmm. well, good. Uh, a big subject, as you say, and I can see that energetically, you might just be starting to get going for the evening, but uh, it is nearly time to finish, Sabuti. So I just thought I'd ask you, if you had one more minute, whether there was anything from the whole discussion you wanted to come back to, reiterate or include, mm. uh, if you haven't already. Yes. Well, I think what's been very useful in this, this discussion is that we've clarified what ordinary uh, positive emotion is, and we've clarified what it's not. Mm. But especially, I, I'm pleased at the way this, this got drawn out in terms of uh, what the transcendentalizing tendency of positive emotion is and uh, that ultimately well adriana put it very movingly that uh, 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 my meta is reality so in positive emotion you're not merely you know doing something preliminary uh, uh, that you've got to do because you you won't get the better practice the bigger practices till you've done it but you are actually 
uh, uh, striking at the heart of, of reality, at the heart of the Dhamma. So I'm, I'm pleased at the way that's evolved. Mm. And I, I feel quite inspired at that, that, the way that's turned out. Yeah. Yeah, no, excellent uh, discussion. And thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. There are so many more, aren't there? But Indeed, yeah. uh, anyone uh, listening now can tune into Zabuti again at 7 p.m. the next three evenings and at 8 a.m. for uh, morning meditations um, on these themes. So that would be a particularly good way to consolidate what we're hearing. Can um, I just say that, that each in the morning session, we're doing the meditation practice that relates to the evening session. So that makes a very good pairing if you're able to uh, accommodate that. Indeed. So tomorrow morning, we'll be looking at spiritual receptivity through the, uh, the practice of just sitting. Mm, excellent. So tune in then. Uh, just two more things uh, from me. One is um, just to, well, a little request uh, for the sake of Subuti. So Subuti is giving us his time and energy uh, uh, completely for free, like I say, out of friendship uh, to the center. Um, and uh, he lives modestly and gives uh, what he can to his friends. Um, so whenever Sabuti does a visit, we ask if uh, anyone who's benefited from that uh, would like to give a donation. We, we want to make that possible. So Guillaume is just posting the appropriate link in the chat now uh, for you to give to um, Sabuti. I don't think it will go into expanding his jacket collection. It will probably uh, help him uh, reach out to friends in India, uh, Central Europe, uh, give the Dharma in this particularly um, challenging time. So do, uh, do give generously if you're able to. And uh, uh, well, apart from that, we only have a short closing ritual, um, the transference of merit and self-surrender. So if you haven't come across this before, uh, it's simply a statement that we want. Uh, well, any positivity that we've cultivated through our activity, any benefit uh, to go to all beings, uh, as you'll hear, um, not just keep it for ourselves uh, in that selfish way we were talking about. It's a, a sort of invocation of that spirit um, from, uh, well, from the mind of a bodhisattva, a being like these uh, uh, coloured figures behind me who uh, give entirely of themselves for the benefit of others. So I'll just read that text. Um, uh, I think everybody else, uh, possibly including Sabuti, will be muted uh, for this. Um, so I'll read the line and you at home uh, could just repeat it back. Uh, and that will close our evening. So the transference of merit and self-surrender in call and response. May the merit gained. May the merit gained. In my acting thus, in my acting thus, go to the alleviation of the suffering of all beings. Go to the alleviation of the suffering of all beings. My personality throughout my existences. My personality throughout my existences. My possessions. My possessions. And my merit in all three ways. And my merit in all three ways. I give up without regard to myself. For the benefit of all beings. Just as the earth and other elements are serviceable in many ways to the infinite number of beings inhabiting limitless space, so may I become so may I become that which maintains all beings, that which maintains all beings situated, throughout space, situated throughout space, so long as all have not attained, so long as all have not attained to peace. Be peace. Good. So uh, we may as well unmute Sabuti for a goodbye. Um, and those were the uh, gentle voices of Jahit and Guillaume you were hearing there who are helping me uh, in the shrine room, um, muting and unmuting and adjusting lights and so on. So thank you very much to you too. And thank you again so much to Sabuti. Um, look forward to seeing uh, many of you in further sessions this week. So uh, enjoy your week. Um, and I hope you can take some inspiration from these uh, events and tune in again. So goodbye from us. Thank you very much, Pragna Pragna Manas, for your very pertinent questioning. Yeah, good. Thank you, Sabuti. Okay. Good night. Good night. Great.
Ay, no. 